Hey everyone, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 545, sort of our Computex recap, being recorded Wednesday, June 5th, 2019. I'm Jim Tannis. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Sebastian Peak. And thanks for joining us. Uh, we, we've we missed you. We, we missed a week there. I was in Taipei for Computex all last week, and the goal, as we mentioned in the last show, was to do some uh, some uh, posts or some updates, some video and podcast updates throughout the week. But we had uh, technical issues with bandwidth and, uh, and devices, and it just, it, 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 it turned out to where I was struggling to even upload single images to Twitter, let alone trying to stream audio and video. So Unfortunately, we, we couldn't get anything going uh, last week, but I did learn some lessons on what to do to prepare for next time. This is my first time in Taipei, first time at Computex, so hopefully uh, we can uh, avoid similar situations in the future at these big events. But uh, we're here, we're ready to talk about some of the events, uh, some of the big stuff we saw at Computex, and uh, we, we, we're not going to cover everything. We, we're, there's, there was too much, uh, so we're going to hit the big stuff, or stuff we think is the big stuff, and if we miss something that you think is important, let us know. Send us a tweet or leave a comment on... Uh, on this video or at the the podcast post at pcpro.com and we'll we'll see if we can look into getting some additional coverage of the topics that you care about but uh, let's real quick let's uh run through the uh the the, uh, the housekeeping stuff uh we go live normally wednesdays at 10 p.m eastern that works out to thursday morning 2 a.m utc to know when we go live for the podcast or when we do special events that are live uh join our mailing list this is at uh, pcpro.com slash subscribe it's just a name and an email that goes into a uh a very simple email. We don't use it for any other purpose. Uh, no marketing, no, no uh, article delivery or anything like that. No deals. It's just a simple email that goes out an hour or so before we go live to let you know uh, so you don't miss a show. And uh, if you want to support us at uh, PC Per, go to patreon.com slash PC Per where you can become a patron and help us do what we do here. And we have the, uh, the continuing uh, uh, theme, I guess, where if you become a new patron or increase your pledge during the live stream. I'll get a notification and I will read your name live on the air or whatever you put in that name field. So if you do want to put something funny or humiliating in there, uh, just edit your name before you make the pledge and then make the pledge and then I'll get that and then you can change your name back or whatever. So uh, check that out, patreon.com slash PC per. Uh, really appreciate it. And of course, uh, we, we, we haven't, I've neglected to mention this, uh, but we still have joshtech.com. Joshtech.com. We do is still, still have joshtech.com. We do. It's it's still live. It it it, uh, it redirects to our Teespring store where we've got T-shirts, mugs, uh, Josh Tech merchandise, PC Per merchandise, some of our uh, favorite slogans. And uh, when you uh, when you shop there, you get something cool. We get a little bit of a commission on that. So uh, check that out as well. JoshTech.com. That's uh, J O S H T E T E K K dot com. So we have a huge show today because of that, uh, because of Computex and not being able to cover things as they happened last week. Although we did at PCPro.com, all the written stuff was live, but uh, no audiovisual stuff. So let's jump right into the news. And uh, first off, Intel kicked off the week last week. This was uh, interesting because, you know, Intel normally has a very big headlining presence at Computex. And of course, Intel was there and had some keynotes and some big announcements, but AMD for the first time ever, headlined the official Computex opening keynote. And so uh, Intel wasn't happy about that. And we got at the last minute, I had to change my flight plans and everything. It was the very last minute saying, we want to have a little announcement of our own. So Sunday night uh, before uh, AMD did their thing Monday morning, uh, local Taipei time, Sunday night uh, or Sunday afternoon, I guess, Intel had uh, some journalists out to a, uh, a conference room to have an event of their own. And uh, this, you know, this was the a theme that they're approaching that we've seen before in Cascade Lake uh, when they launched that, which is we need to start looking at real world performance. That was sort of the overall theme of this event that they had. And, you know, their, their, their point is, is the synthetic benchmarks no longer reflect actual user experiences in the majority of cases. And so let's talk about how we can evaluate processors from the press side, how Intel and other manufacturers can make development decisions and, and uh, research decisions on, on building products that have real world uh, implications or that have a, a, create a better real world experience. And so that was the, the key messaging from this event. And of course, this was hosted by somebody we, we recognize, 
familiar face there. Uh, this was, his, I, th I believe, his first big public Intel um, hosting uh, event. You know, where he he was at center so stage. So why for was this. Mike Zuckerberg doing it? Uh, I I don't know. I guess he's just trying to branch out. You know, he's he's always looking uh -huh. for for new challenges. So so of course, Ryan. Does he know he should be wearing vertical stripes? Uh, well, he's been you know he's been running, man. He's been losing some weight. He's looking good. Wow. So he can get away with the uh, the horizontal stripes. You know, it's. Uh, yeah, he's been doing you know five Ks and half marathons and uh, you know dang Intel that Intel corporate you know mind and body keeping things healthy has really uh, really got to him. So so I don't I don't stand next to him anymore uh, at any public events because that's just humiliating for me. But uh, so Ryan was there uh, to to talk about uh, this stuff and kind of looking at they, they gave a good presentation. They said okay, well look here here's. Here's how the press evaluates a processor, for example. 80% of the press outlets that Intel surveyed run Cinebench. But like 0.04% or I guess 0.54% of users ever actually launch, let alone regularly run, ever actually launch Cinema 4D, which is the 3D application that Cinebench is based on. Um, you know, so, so is that really a valid comparison, they said? Or, you know, everyone l runs, you know, Luxmark, but nobody runs uh, applications that actually take advantage of the things that Luxmark is is, uh, is testing. And, you know, I, I got their point, and I think the majority of the press there understood what their point was. The pushback from the press, and including myself and my impression there, was, you know, the, this data that they generated of the popularity of the actual percentages that are being run this was derived from surveys through their their Intel graphics driver. You know, like sometimes when you install software, they say, do you want to participate in our user customer experience program? So they were kind of tracking, you know, the kind of apps that people run. And uh, my, my pushback on to them was, okay, but that's not the audience that's ever going to read a, a detailed processor review at PC Per or a non-tech or, or Tom's Hardware or whatever. Th that audience is a general audience that may not even be aware that these kind of reviews exist. They go to Best Buy and buy a, a computer and it has an Intel chip in it. So that's what they use. And so I, I agree that most people don't actually run Cinema 4D or that most people don't run Pavre or, or things like that or Blender. But the people who do are the ones who are more likely to actually seek out these reviews. So well, I mean, apart from the exception of Steam, uh, until you get to Photoshop on that list, you are looking at corporate computer. Who uh, does the person doesn't even have a say as to what they're going to be provided. But uh, you're yeah. showing VLC, WinRAR, uh, Word, PowerPoint, Excel. Like until and Skype will come in there and Outlook. But until Photoshop, which is going to be installed on special machines, and with the exception of Steam, which is everywhere. I mean, that's probably right there. Corporate desktop users. I'm sure that's a, a big part of it. And, um, you know, I'm sure that even, even in the consumer space, you know, how many people, you, you know, Chrome and Word and even WinRAR is a common workload for consumers. But yeah, exactly. There, there, is, a, there is a segment of this population or this, this sample size that is not going to, they not, they, they're not going to be aware that benchmarks for processors exist. They may not know exactly what processors in their system. They just go to Best Buy and buy the one that's on the shelf that looks good, or they go to their corporate purchasing guy and get what they get. So, you know, right, you're right. That has a, that, that is a, a, a good take on, on this data or the app, uh, applicability of this data to what we should test. But I, I do get the point um, that, we, we, we should, I, theoretically, we as the press should try to make our reviews as relevant to the audience as possible. I just don't know if the audience that Intel wants us to test for is our audience. Uh, so, you know, but I get what they're saying. Now, even though I think there's, there's legitimacy here, that this is a valid argument to make, is a valid sword to, to, to fall on in terms of like making a stand about how we should develop things going forward, I also honestly believe we wouldn't hear this. This would never. This event would not have taken place, and they wouldn't be talking about this either in this consumer sense or as they did a couple months ago with Cascade Lake and the Enterprise. We, they wouldn't say it if they were still maintaining performance lead in processors, right? I mean, if they were still if they were still kicking butt and Ryzen hadn't panned out and, and Epic hadn't panned out, 
Um, I don't know. If we, I just can't, I honestly don't believe we would see this this take. So I don't begrudge them or or think that they're doing anything wrong. They're trying to take the best of the situation they find themselves in. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. I I I think that <clears throat> in the last five years we've been hearing a little bit more from kind of around the the entire thing is this 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 used experience this individual experience it's not just benchmark numbers it's it's the whole thing because when you start to consider io and memory amounts and and all that i mean what feels snappy to you where you know it's easy to run a cinebench it's easy to do these heavy duty floating point integer intensive applications that that you can benchmark and and you can see some actual serious results uh in between cpus that you know firefox or chrome or whatever is is just not going to show you my cat's taking a leap off the off the desk you go cat anyway (laughs) um and so, you know, people have been talking about this, and, and AMD has been kind of talking about this because, you know, their FX processors in the vast majority of things just worked perfectly fine back in the day. And, you know, they were one of the first to have, you know, SATA 6G controllers, and that was a bigger deal when when uh, SSDs finally went over to SATA 6, and, and Intel didn't have, you know, SATA 6 controllers on their chipsets, or they had, like, you know, maybe one or two of them, and it just was... You know, it's it's something that that people have been talking about for a long time, but there hasn't been a major push. So this is interesting that Intel has done this. I mean, if you ever you know followed Francois on Twitter, I mean he he has been talking about this for kind of years, and so I think that it's been brewing, and it's not that you know Intel is is sitting behind the eight ball, because in ways they are, but in other ways they're they're still not. It's a complex situation, but. Yeah, I, th- I you know I wonder how much we're going to see perspectives change in what really is important, and um, you know. But I, on the other hand, we we already have products like you know i threes, i fives, and then we've got the Ryzen threes and the Ryzen fives, and these non you know top end processors that people use every day and are perfectly happy with. Right. So are these top processors really only for enthusiasts and those who can actually leverage that when you're actually doing stuff like Cinema 4D or Pavre or things that will actually use this? Or, you know, like in my group, the statistics people running our programs that will hammer 32 threads and uh, 96 gigs of, of memory just because they can. It's not the average user, though. Right, and I think that's 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 kind of tackling the two issues, which is sort of like the you know, processor speed has, has exceeded the development there has exceeded the uh, user need in many cases because of, for basic productivity, web browsing, even like photo editing and stuff, it's for for the common consumer user. You know, an i three is probably more than enough, or a Ryzen three. Uh, but also looking at this whole spec, yes, evaluating the highest end stuff. Uh, and, and trying to tailor it towards that audience is important. Uh, but even, but even you know, Intel, one of their examples, which they used, which again is valid, because I, I do believe there is some validity in these arguments, is that uh, in certain workloads, there is still a difference. And they, for example, one of the workloads they used was building a like maybe 50 page, I don't remember, recall the size, but it was building a PDF in Adobe Acrobat. And I've got uh, a bunch of images, I'm gonna export it as a PDF and they paired a Ryzen, or I'm sorry, they paired a, a Core i3 against a Ryzen 7. And the Core i3 beat it easily, like significantly. And so that, you know, there are scenarios where it's not general, you know, it's not processors competing at certain categories, it's, it's strengths of each platform. So my view then is how do we how do we realistically approach that? How many realistic workloads can we tackle? Now, this is more for Sebastian because he's the one who does all the benchmarks for us. So how much work do you want to do to be comfortable that you've adequately tested a processor? Don't say five minutes. Yeah. If, if you're running like scripted testing, maybe it's five minutes of actual work. But no, if I'm 
it's going to be a very laborious to do it thoroughly and to go back and test enough processors to make it like a, like a legitimate study it's going to be like three at least three generations of intel core processors versus like two to three generations of ryzen processors so at least yeah. you don't have to switch motherboards on the ryzen well i mean i will <laughs> Which actually will help because the more independent platforms there are, the faster you can test because there's, there's concurrent benchmarks running. But yeah. I'm sure I'll still come close to wearing out some uh, LGA sockets and some Intel boards. You know, again, I don't want to spend too much time. We've got so much to work through here. But um, that's, you know, that's Intel's argument. That's their official position for both for enterprise and consumers. And so, uh, I, and again, I, I agree completely in theory. It's just about trying to practically do it and, and do it in a way that's honest and not just trying to find areas where Intel still wins and then promote those. So, um, so, you know, we'll, we'll be looking at this going forward in terms of how we test, how we present and, uh, and yeah, but, uh, moving on the other topic that they approached or that they, they talked about, uh, in this early Sunday event was ice Lake, which we knew was going to be coming. They had uh, briefed us and they had teased that they were going to be announcing it. And ice Lake is their new 10 nanometer, part uh, for mobile, but uh, they focus specifically on Gen 11 graphics, which is, again, they've talked about this for months now, but this is the, the mobile GPU, integrated GPU in, in Ice Lake, and uh, it's pretty impressive. They did some uh, very good work. Uh, they, they call it a single generation improvement, um, which technically, I guess, is true because Gen 10 didn't ship because Cannon Lake was sort of an abortion, their first 10 nanometer uh, attempt, uh, but you know, but, but 10, Gen 10 was developed and they tried to make it work. So, so there, there's a little bit of a, a distortion here, but in terms of what we get out of them in a, in a product we can buy, yes, it is a single generation improvement and it ranges from, you know, 40% better to over a hundred percent better. So doubling performance in graphics. Now, Intel's not positioning this as a, a gaming first product. They're not saying you should go out and dump your NVIDIA or AMD discrete GPU for gaming. And they're targeting uh, a 1080p experience, is what they said. So they said, you know, let's look at some of these popular games. World of Tanks, Dirt Rally 2, Rocket League, Overwatch, Fortnite. You know, here are some games that are pretty popular, you know, AAA experiences mostly. And at 1080p, at low to medium quality settings, you're going to get at least 30 and on some of the titles, uh, 60 frames per second experience with Gen 11. And that's pretty good. You know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a, a remarkable again, quote, single generation uh, improvement in performance. So very, very good as, and we'll talk more about Ice Lake in a moment, but but as, as uh, disappointing in some ways as Ice Lake has been, or as 10 nanometers has been for Intel, their graphics uh, leaps are pretty impressive. And not only does uh, the generation over generation performance uh, pan out pretty well, but when you look, compare it to the latest Ryzen mobile parts at 25 watts, they're, almost at parity. You look at these numbers, like they're losing in a couple categories, but they're equal or better in, in others. Uh, Gen 11 versus the Ryzen APU. And that's a Ryzen 7 3700U. So that, again, is also pretty incredible to say that Intel has thus, far, you know, so relatively quickly caught up with, at least for now, AMD's APU performance, which has always been one of the strongest parts of, a, of, of trying to sell a Ryzen uh, integrated, you know, a Ryzen APU right with integrated graphics, especially, you know, with, with the Vega parts and having, having Ice Lake, uh, Ice Lake U again at 25 Watts at parity, you know, effectively parity. So that, that's pretty, pretty impressive there. Uh, they also, you know, they've got some additional features in Gen 11 that they don't have in Ryzen, uh, you know, things like variable, uh, refresh, uh, rate, sh variable rate shading, I should say. Uh, which they've teased and Microsoft has teased. So there's, there's implementations for that kind of stuff. And, and so it's, it's a pretty, on the graphics side alone, very, very uh, impressive for Ice Lake. And then finally, uh, at this event, they teased something new. Um, we had heard some rumors. Uh, we had some leaks that uh, we couldn't verify, but they were only about a week before this, but Intel, of course, came out and has announced the i9-9900KS. And I got official confirmation the S does not stand for Shroud. So, uh, but it I is the... It. Yeah, I mean, of course, they could be lying, but... 
It's, it's, you know, KS Kentucky Shroud. It, it makes yeah. sense. Come on. Well, I was hoping, you know, if you recall that, that rumor from a few months ago of the KFC part, you know, that would have been, that would have been beautiful, but unfortunately not. Socket today. looking good. A socket looking oh. good. Yep. Wow. See, you even got the uh, marketing all taken care of. Yeah. But just the, make uh, sure that you copyright this one, Josh, because you missed up tighten up your graphics. <laughs> I did. Um, so anyway, yeah, the, the i9 9900KS is, is the same uh, as the, it's the same base as the 9900K and the 9900KF, which was that special part without integrated graphics. But it's a 4.0 gigahertz base and an out-of-the-box all-core 5 gigahertz boost. So that's 8 cores, 16 threads, and all-core 5 gigahertz boost as a guaranteed sort of out-of-the-box out overclock. Um, or, or not overclock, but, but boost. So that's, you know, that's impressive, except we don't know pricing. We don't know exact availability. It'll be out later this year. They said, we don't know TDP. Um, we don't know, you know, that therefore related to TDP, we just don't know how it'll be in terms of thermal performance. Uh, so, so very little here, except just knowing that Intel is about to sell a part that is a eight core, 16 thread part that is all core five gigahertz guaranteed. So I, I bet that's going to be cheap. Oh yeah, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> and now I do wonder because of, uh, AM, AMD's price competitiveness on third gen Ryzen, which we'll get to in a moment, maybe that will change things up for, for Intel, but still a lot of details missing. This does seem to be, you know, it's a product that when they saw what Ryzen was coming in at in terms of performance and price, they, they wanted to make sure they still had a, a part out there that could, could claim performance leadership, at least in terms of things like gaming and single threaded performance and stuff like that. So, so it'll be interesting to see. We'll, we'll see how we get this. Uh, now they did also point out that unlike the 8086 K, which came out, um, last year, that, that special edition anniversary part, this is not a special edition or limited edition. This will be a regular, they, they call it a, I'm sorry, they call it a special edition. It's not a limited edition. So it will be regularly available supposedly as part of their lineup. We'll see about how they ship and you know, what the volume is on these things. But, uh, there won't be, this won't be a time limited thing or a unit limited thing. Um, so we'll stay tuned for that. Uh, now let's quickly then jump into uh, some more details on Ice Lake uh, because Intel then officially announced all the Ice Lake details at their Tuesday press conference. And again, Ice Lake is their first real, you know, 10 nanometer part. And 10 nanometers has been a just a bear for Intel. They've been dealing with this for years. Uh, a lot of, you know, starts and stops. 2015. And yeah, a lot of challenges and, you know, they, they've made it, you know, it's here, it's the sunny cove architecture. So this is the architecture part of their, uh, was it it's process architecture, optimize cadence. So it's launching as a mobile part, uh, between nine and 28 Watts in I three, I five and I seven variants. Uh, they didn't officially release the SKUs though. And there's a great article, I'll link it in the show notes, uh, Charlie over at Semi-Accurate published it today, where he goes in in detail into Ice Lake and Sunny Cove and 10 nanometer challenges and what it means. And the reason that Intel, I think, or, you know, the reason he concludes that Intel did not uh, release a bunch of details like they normally do of, of what this part will be or what the, these, 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 this lineup will be is because it's going to lose in performance in traditional performance to the 14 nanometer counterparts that are already shipping. He, he believes they had a huge IPC increase. It's 18 up to 18% or an average of 18% IPC increase, which was really surprising. It's four core, eight thread, um, up to four core, eight thread configurations, turbo boost up to 4.1 gigahertz, but base clocks are lower than their 14 nanometer counterparts. Now there's some features here. Lots of cool features built in, including the Gen 11 graphics. Now that'll only be a bit available. The, the, the higher end, the one that they're basing all their gaming benchmarks on will be available on their higher end i7 parts. Um, they call it Iris Plus will be the designation there. Uh, but they've got features like um, uh, integrated Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt is fine. Thunderbolt 3 is now finally integrated into the, into the chip itself. Uh, so you've got power savings and uh, better access to PCIe lanes so you get faster throughput. Uh, just with the graphics processors, there's better display outputs. I think you can do two 4K at 60, or no, I'm sorry, three 4K at 60, two 5K 
at 30 or one 8K30 output. So you've got lots of options for like docking stations and, and display outputs there. Uh, memory up to uh, LP4X 3733, so better memory there. Better cache, lot, uh, much improved cache over uh, its predecessors. So that's gonna result in some uh, performance improvements in certain areas. Uh, better IO, so you've got USB 3.1 built in. Uh, you've got 16 lanes of uh, Gen, Gen 3 PCIe, of course, you know, Intel's still on PCIe 3.0. SATA six gigabits, uh, support for the EM, EM, EMMC uh, embedded stuff. So a lot of features here, there's dedicated, new improved dedicated HEVC encoders for your quick sync stuff. So if you're doing streaming or video work, uh, you're gonna have better performance there. Uh, but it's, uh, here, yeah, here's a look at some of the uh, IPC stuff. So looking across the range uh, of, of performance improvement, it ranges from, you know, about parity to, or, 1.4x uh, over uh, the uh, uh, previous architecture with an average of an 18% IPC improvement. And that's, that's, that is huge. Again, this is not really truly generation to generation because of Cannon Lake, uh, but from what we can buy, it is. Uh, so this is going to be a, an interesting generation, I think. There's questions about whether Intel can ship this in volume, about profit margins on the, on the yields, uh, questions about how it's going to compare outside of the very low uh, wattage parts in terms of, of 14 nanometer comparisons. Uh, but, you know, they've packed it with features to kind of make up for that. A DL boost, again, we've heard about this with Cascade Lake. DL boost is their AI inference acceleration. Very little you can do with this now, but applications are integrating this stuff and things like uh, CyberLink PowerDirector and PhotoDirector if you've got workloads that can take advantage of this, your Cascade, or I'm sorry, your Ice Lake uh, processor is gonna have a huge boost in those AI accelerated workloads. But again, that's a, that's a question of how the apps you use actually gonna have advan take advantage of this and when. So uh, very interesting. It's, it's gonna be a, a uh, something to, to, to follow as we see if Intel does ship these and, and how they perform compared to their 14 nanometer predecessors. Or not, not even predecessors because they're going to continue to ship. Yeah, counterparts. They're going to be 14 nanometers isn't going away. It's still going to be on the market for two years at least. So, um, so something yeah, to pay I attention think, to. There. I think Charlie's probably in the right area <clears throat> in that 10 nanometer works. They're able to get low power, good performance out of. But once you start getting above that 35, 45, 65 watt envelope, I just don't think that they can they can clock that high without getting TDPs and power draw up there beyond where they're really comfortable with. And, you know, that, that that's a whole host of problems that you start looking at and you're looking at crappy yields and potentially crappy bins uh, when you're, when you're trying to get to that. So yeah, they're, they're keeping 10 nanometer in, in the mobile type envelope where it's a very efficient process, but it just doesn't scale very high up without really massively increasing power. Uh, this is something that TSMC has done really well with their seven nanometer stuff. And, um, you know, eventually it's going to be interesting to do some compare and contrast with with those two processes. I mean, you never really will get a true apples to apples comparison. But when AMD has, you know, features that, you know, a certain die size and certain TDPs and, and draw and, and how fast and you know, in terms of actual clock speed can go versus what Intel can do. So. Yeah, it's um, it's really interesting where Intel is going because uh, boy, that fourteen nanometer sure has some legs. Uh, and then real real quick, sort of related to that, because again, we're going too long on Intel here. We've got AMD to cover still, but uh, alongside Ice Lake, AM, uh, Intel announced the Project Athena initiative, which is a uh, it's a new sort of it's an initiative, a certification program where they're looking at laptop manufacturers in, in this sort of ultra mobile space. And they want to, they feel that there's, you know, the hardware designs aren't great. The battery life's not great. The software is a lot of uh, unnecessary software bloat. And so this, this program is about setting categories or requirements for what will become an Athena, or at least it's, it's their code name for now, a quote, Athena based device. And if you have an Athena based device, consumers will know that it gets X number of battery life, uh, at, at realistic workloads. So that means realistic screen brightness, realistic uh, web or video workloads. Uh, it, it has uh, a certain number of connectivity options 
It has a certain number of performance where the performance doesn't dip if it's on battery compared to power or compared to, you know, AC power. And so what Intel is doing is working with their, their partner manufacturers to set these criteria. The developer, the manufacturers will go and build these systems. Intel will certify them based on key experience indicators or KEIs. And these are again, tying back to Intel's real world uh, push. These are all based supposedly on real world conditions in terms of application launch, wake from sleep, real world battery life again and so on. So it's it's an interesting um, program where Intel has recognized that laptops, especially ultra mobile, but also powerful devices aren't really doing as well as they could, can, could be. And so by setting these requirements and these verifications and then enforcing them, uh, and, and, and again, if you, as a manufacturer, if you meet these and you get Athena certified, you then get Intel marketing dollars. So that's the, the trade-off there. Uh, so, uh, this will be something to look out for. They've got systems already coming soon, including the Acer Swift 5, Dell XPS 13 2-in-1, uh, HP, Envy Wood, HP Envy 13 Wood Series, and the Lenovo Yoga S940, and there will be more coming. This is a multi-year program. They're introducing uh, a series of requirements this year, and then there'll be more, uh, th th there'll be more or they'll change those in subsequent years as conditions change, as, as user demands change. Uh, so... You know, it's a marketing thing, but if, if if they do it right, as a as a consumer, you'll be able to go to the store or, or go online and, and, and see that it's an Athena-based system, an Athena-certified system, and know that it has passed certain requirements to meet that uh, that designation. So, sounds, sounds why do sounds I think really I'm exciting. watching Computex in 2011? Yeah, you know, you know uh, Ultrabook designations and like, Centrino. literally the exact same thing, mm -hmm. and it works so well. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is not the first time Intel has tried something like this. Um, we'll see, you know, things like Ice Lake processors that can, you know, if they're properly utilized. I mean, yeah, the processors don't use as much power now, so you can make them wafer thin, but yeah, we'll see. We will see. And I know that uh, some of our, some, some of the people in the room with me as they were announcing this, including, again, to mention Charlie over at Semi Accurate, were very distressed because now... He feels programs like this uh, force the, even though the, this is not meant to be all laptops, this is meant to be a certain class of laptops that you have a choice to buy, but he feels that this will force de developer or manufacturers to push smaller and lighter and less upgradable and less repairable form factors. And so uh, there, there was some concern from the users, uh, the power, admittedly power users in the room about what this meant for the overall laptop market, even though it's not intended to address the entire market. So. So let's get to uh, arguably the biggest story of the uh, show and arguably the biggest story of the year. Uh, this is, of course, Ryzen 3000 series. AMD took the keynote stage to open Computex and, as expected, announced a range of products, starting with Ryzen desktop. Also, we'll get to Navi uh, graphics, which they teased, and then, of course, Epic in the data center with uh, their Rome-based parts. But let's start with Ryzen 3000 for desktop. Uh, Sebastian, uh, you covered this for us. What, 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 tell us, you know, tell us what happened here. What's, what's the good news uh, with this announcement? Well, I'll briefly introduce this, but I want Josh to talk about this because he's our processor and AMD aficionado. But yeah, they came on stage. Lisa Sue announced what we already knew was coming. We just we finally got some product names. We got some clock speeds, and this was prior to Intel coming out with a graph of. You know, as they're showing 18% IPC uplift versus one to two generations previous, Zen 2, according to AMD, has a 15% IPC improvement over Zen Plus. So that's huge. And when you see that, and then you see some of the clock speeds they're getting, and they're, of course, core counts, which are ridiculous. So the, the three main processors from the announcement were, they started off with a uh, Ryzen 7 part, the 3700X and the 3800X. Uh, eight cores, 16 threads between them. The 3800X hits higher clocks, but takes 105 watts. If uh, a little bit lower clocks, the 3700X is hitting only 65 watts. And then the, the big one, the kind of one more thing at the end, it wasn't a 16 core part, but it was a 12 core 24 thread part that hits up to 4.6 gigahertz at uh, boost. That's only going to be five hundred dollars. Only one hundred and five watt parts. That's if you look at what Intel has, 
to compete with that currently it's a high performance desktop part and it's like twelve hundred dollars i think 11.99 for that part so 4.99 less than half as much money same core count aggressive clocks and uh another important thing from this not only is like cache size level three cache on these is huge it's 32 megabytes and 64 megabytes for the top end part the, you know, fairly low TDPs, which makes sense. These are high performance parts, but the, the top TDP is only 105 watts. And then the DDR standard, it's up to 3200 DDR4. So you get a lot more memory bandwidth just from JDAC spec memory. So assuming motherboard vendors have done qualifications, we get BIOS updates, or you buy a new X570 board, you're going to be able to just go to, you know, whichever e-tailer and buy 3200 megahertz RAM is just going to work. Whereas the previous standard obviously was Zen Plus, we were dealing with 24 mega, uh, 2400 RAM, and then having to overclock, which was not universally successful with every board, with every mother, with every uh, RAM but vendor. But so. think you supported officially 2933 memory. I think so, yeah. With the uh, the okay. second generation, but yeah, it um, <clears throat> the memory controller and, and uh, Infinity Fabric and all that stuff, it it didn't. Um, it really came alive at 3200, but it was not always real stable. So it's nice to see this stable. Yeah, start at 32 and then start overclocking. And we've seen X570 board specifications where it's like 4,000, 4,400 plus with overclocking support. So that'll be that'll be cool. Seeing somebody hit four to five thousand mega transfers per second on memory and see what that does to some of these processors, especially if these processors overclock. We can maybe see close to five gigahertz on them too. But Josh, what are your impressions from this announcement? Uh, it looks to be an impressive part. Uh, it's it's certainly a jump for AMD. <clears throat> and what they've done in the past two years has been pretty impressive. I mean, their FX series was troublesome to say the least. And they had huge internal reorganizations. Rory Reed came in after Dirk hit the road and then you know he kind of got things financially on the line and then you know he's like you know okay this is about as much as i can do all i'm interested in doing let's give it to somebody else lisa came in she has a great engineering background she has a great understanding of what transistors can and can't do what design can and can't do and enough financial background to be able to put it all together to make amd a much more efficient system as well as being able to set a reasonable roadmap <clears throat> and updates that they can count on, and not only that they can count on, but their OEM partners can count on. So when De Dell decides to say, okay, we've got an X amount of money that we need to put over to development of an AMD platform, and they're promising this in Q2 of whatever year, we're going to start doing the legwork for that at least, you know, nine to 12 months before. And they're expecting to get money back from that R&D by the next year. And so if AMD continually misses its marks, OEMs are not going to be happy because that's just money wasted that they could have used spent. They, they could have spent elsewhere during that time. And so Getting on to the Ryzen 3000 series, not only do we have you know a pretty good IPC jump, we've got a couple of hundred megahertz worth of extra clock speed, and we can go into you know talking about design and and, and transistor performance and what seven nanometer actually brings to the table, you know when you're talking CPUs versus graphics, but that would take a lot of time, and you really need to be careful in listening to some of the commentary outside of this and 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 some other you know more reasonable podcasts and videos but when you put it all together amd has a compelling product they have something that they have been able to do really for the first time since maybe 2003 2004 with the athlon 64. they've introduced a new architecture and they've iterated upon that architecture and they've taken advantages taken advantage of Intel's inability to jump past 14 nanometer to provide a more dense, more power efficient, and slightly faster product than what we've seen before. 
And because they're going with chiplets, they have a lot more flexibility with how they distribute parts. So, you know, the 3900X is a 12 core, 24 thread part. Well, because of chiplets, if, if they have a whole bunch of uh, really good bins in the future, they can go for a 16 core, 32 thread part on AM4 and not exceed 105 to 110 watt TDP. So it's, um, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to make hay while the sun is shining because eventually Intel is going to throw enough money at its process nodes and they've got so much talent in engineering and design and their R and D is so good that I, you know, I once heard describe they've got so much stuff that they could apply to any process or design, but whenever they feel the need, they just, you know, kind of take into the bin and, and sprinkle sprinkle stuff into a new design and, and you get 18% increase in IPC from generation to generation. It just you know Intel is getting handcuffed right now with, with process technology and die sizes and until they get 10 nanometer totally figured out with higher TDP stuff and higher clock speeds, AMD's got a chance to really shine here and if they can show next year that they have a refresh of 3000 series, that's going to help them out. And we're not even talking about introducing the first desktop and notebook PCIe 4.0 um, compliant parts. Well, okay, no, not, no, not, net, not mobile yet. That's going to be a little bit down the road, but it's going to be there. But yeah, in terms of servers, that's huge uh, with I.O., they're going to have it out here with Epic and Rome. They're going to have it in desktop. And we've already seen with the Fizon controllers, IO will take a 30% jump in performance right off the bat. You got a controller that can handle that and, and the uh, 3D NAND and enough stacks of 3D NAND, you're getting 5 gigabytes per second of read speeds and up to like 4.2 gigabytes per second of writes. I mean, that's that's a massive advantage in certain workloads that AMD could take advantage of. Intel can't. They don't have PCI 4.0 controllers anywhere, anytime soon. Uh, they're, they're so I don't know if that five. segues into what we're doing, but if you guys have anything else to, to add to what I just previously said, my little stream of consciousness that was not entirely organized, but let's hear it. One thing I'll add about the bandwidth for storage is an enterprise, they don't even have to go to buy four or 4.0 drives. This could just free up lanes or, you know, you could have PCIe four by two drives and more of them, depending on what the actual deployment is. So you could see a lot more storage or, you know, different arrays taking advantage of just, you know, double the bandwidth per, per lane. I'm more excited about, you know, eight channel controllers running PCIe 4. That Fizon controller, I believe is eight channels. We're gonna see some four channel stuff. They're going to be able to get uh, you know, as good or better than some of the high end PCIe Gen 3 by four drives with, with just four channels at PCIe 4. So it, it really depends on what we see from different controllers out there. The Fizon controller is the only game in town right now. Silicon Motions is probably not coming until next year. The latest I was reading about that, they didn't have anything anywhere near as fast as what Fizon has, which is why everybody's going with the Fizon controller. But and we haven't heard talking anything about from Samsung. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the big one, yeah. and that's be... that's so weird. But I think the problem with with jumping into PCI 4.0, um, it's really really power hungry, and the Fizon, I think uh, they they thought it was an 8 watt TDP controller which for a small chip that's pretty hot that's why we see heat sinks on all these NVMe drives that are coming out I mean Gigabyte has a massive one Corsair's, Corsair's got a big one I well, mean let's, let's, let's jump in let's uh, real quick let's because we've got those later on let's just take them tackle them now we can look at them while we're talking about them here but yeah these sorry these early no it's all right these early uh, 4.0 drives we've got this one uh again all fizon based gigabyte oris 
NVMe Gen 4 SSD. Uh, and look at look at the heat sink on that. A wrap around all copper heat sink. I mean, it's it's a well, gum stick. Is it's yeah, but it's more of a thermal a heat spreader. I, I don't want to channel a certain submariner too heavily, but mm, yeah, <laughs> when you warm up flash, it gets better. So by but, having but, this, yes, but the controller right. doesn't like it so much. But right. so by having the controller going and finding a way, and come on, put some super pipes on there to to channel the heat right off of the controller and onto those the, the flash chips, actually makes sense. That would that would seem to be a better thing. Instead, we've got these massive heat sinks. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. Because I mean, now you're still going to have the uh, the heat sitting on top of. The, the poor little controller that is desperately trying to dump heat off. So, you know, you're, you're going to run into some interesting issues and I don't know if we, there's got to be a equilibrium there somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like eventually that's going to hit a, a, a temperature where the flash is happy and the controller is not. And I, we'll, I, we'll see who was it that put up the uh, water cooled one. Um, yes. Uh, who does have that water cooled SSD? Was it, uh, it was an OWC. Um, I can't remember. I yeah, but look, if it's sorry. if it's I'll covering the, the Corsair name, one, I'll find it in a second here. Yeah. yeah, and and here's uh, here's another example of a PCIe 4.0 drive coming from Corsair, and that's got its own you know a different this style but equally impressive heatsink on it. Um, now, and I believe we don't have any pricing on any of these drives yet, right? No, no. Yeah. yeah so we'll have no. to we'll see how that turns out. But these drives are going to hit, you know five gigabytes a second of sequential performance. And uh, I guess that's in reads and, and writes are over four gigabytes a second. So yeah, it looks like Corsair is yeah. going to be probably one of the first out mm -hmm. with one of these, the way that they're talking and the, the amount of samples that were there, but everybody's going to be pretty quick after that because Fizon has product that is available now and it yeah. may not be pretty, but again, they're they're making some serious hay when nobody else has a controller, <clears throat> because yeah. that's one thing that Samsung they they like to have their controllers not suck a whole lot of power, but be really high performance. And the whole PCIe 4.0 thing it is a challenge, and it's going to be very interesting to see how they address that. And when they address that, my guess is that we'll see. I've been trying to keep my ear to the rail and I've only gotten, you know, run over about three times by the train. But <clears throat> I would guess CES of 2020 that we'll see the first Samsung controllers and they're going to be really good. But it's going to be a while. So Fison is going to mm -hmm. be the only game in town for next six to eight months. Yeah, if not longer, and they're gonna love it. Yes. Oh yeah. And I, I did speak. By the way, uh, go ahead. I, I was gonna say, real quick. I, I did speak with uh, AMD at Computex, and they confirmed uh, RAID support for PCIe 4.0 storage. Now, Good. as we know, because uh, to mention our, our favorite Submariner again, Alan uh, had some some headaches with both AMD and Intel as they tried to do uh, NVMe RAID. Uh, la well, I guess it was that last year or the year before, but in their first implementations of NVMe RAID, there was some, some quirks and some some caveats. So we'll see how it actually pans out. But a uh, AMD did say without reservation that they would be supporting RAID, uh, you know, as long as the board, you know, chooses to support that. But but uh, so you've got some opportunities here for some incredibly insane uh volumes for working volumes or cache volumes or just never want to see a loading screen in steam didn't gigabyte show off their their card that supported four of those nvme and we're getting 15 gigabyte mm -hmm. per second yes of read speeds yes yes that's nuts uh, is, yeah. yeah and that by the that's way that beautiful. one the five controller apparently is putting out about eight is taking about eight watts to hit those speeds. No, the eight watts uh, TDP yeah. is yeah, yeah, it's what I heard. But that's, that's a lot. That's yeah. a yeah. I mean, it's not massive, but it requires the heat sinks that we are seeing, and that's why the gigabyte thing had a big fan on it because four of those puppies in there are producing thirty-two watts 
of thermal dissipated power. Which is up around really... CPU levels. Yeah. If you're worried about the NAND getting too cool, then we just need really, really tiny heat sinks and fans. I was wondering if maybe like, you know, old school motherboard heat sinks, but even even like the 486 is too big. You'd, you'd be covering some of the flash. You have to do a little bit of modification there. Well, you just need like to move it to the flash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. If you can use, you know, if the, we just had oh, more yeah. super pipes, right. you need I'm super just, pipe NVMe yeah. using I, Samsung's liquid cooling technology of a pipe. So we'll see. Well, we, we've, uh, you know, I, I talked to uh, all these companies, and uh, we'll be hopefully getting samples as soon as they're available. And of course, pricing is the the big question too. Uh, you know, we, we know the pricing for for the processors and the boards. In some cases, uh, it's it's these more exotic PCIe 4.0 stuff that's going to be interesting to watch so you, you know what the bad part about all this is jim what's that you're gonna have to redo your test bed yes i will and uh, amd is gonna be so happy jim yes. tannis used our product for his new pcie nvme test bed uh sure i guess they might it's quite the feather that. in their cap Although I, I, it's actually good timing because I've been having a heck of a time with a certain manufacturer's drive, and I'm I had to. We try to keep the test beds stable, so we don't do Windows updates, BIOS updates. We unless there's an issue that we you know that we do, but in order to keep cons results consistent, we don't change the storage test bed at all once it's set. And I've had I finally gave up challenge. I don't want to say which company it is, but it's been causing me issues for months at this point, and I finally gave up and updated some BIOS. And Windows settings, and so I may have to redo everything anyway. So bring on PCI 4.0. Uh, of course, then Intel will go to five in a couple of years. But and besides, years. you're going to have to figure out how to do benchmarking all over again because how exactly to get around the caching when it's going that fast? Right. I, <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do some some interesting stuff with data to create data sets that can be measured uh, accurately, but. Uh, and it's a good problem to have. Um, let's let's jump to AMD's other big announcement, uh, which was more of a tease because they're going to be revealing more details uh, this coming week at uh, E3. But this was also, of course, the big unveiling of Navi. And uh, uh, Sebastian, I think you're going to be at E3 to hear from AMD about this more. But uh, tell us what they, they gave to us thus far at uh, Computex. Well, uh, not a lot. They, they showed... Like a G, an RTX 2070 versus an unnamed RX 5000 family GPU on stage, and they were showing performance with a, a AMD optimized benchmark called Strange Brigade. And of course, any manufacturer provided you know performance demos are always they're taken with a grain of salt. It was performing a lot better. They were they showed one particular demo that took advantage of the PCIe 4 interface with a Radeon 7, and uh, you know it's. But really, oh lord, that were... that thing was was, you know, I hate to say it, <clears throat> that was that was a terrible benchmark. Yes, your throughput and bandwidth is going to be faster, but what in the hell uses it other than this very very specific three D mark test? Right, you know they're so, they're showing what they have it's faster an advantage. Yeah, it's faster. I, and the thing is, like, we don't know exactly what the specs are going to be. We don't even know the necessarily the product names. They talked about the 5700 series. I don't know what you guys think about the naming. Like, the, originally, rumors were coming out pretty strong. It was going to be the 3080 coming out and the 3070 to, you know, leapfrog and or NVIDIA's naming. You know, I, I don't know why this matters. If if for some reason somebody goes into a micro center and sees 3080 and they think it's better than a 2080 from NVIDIA, but maybe psychologically that's an advantage. They went so far ahead that it looks like uh like early 2000s NVIDIA product name now, like RX 5200 or you know 50, it looks like FX. I look at this and I just see like FX 5200, FX 5700. Yeah, and that was but, not good. I, I think they kind of had to because apparently NVIDIA was trademarking things left and right for GPU names before this announcement. So they had to go all the way up to 5,000. But, I mean, this is, 
if if this can compete with an RTX 2070, it's all going to come down to price. We saw with the Radeon 7, it comes out, it can compete head to head, depending on the game, with an RTX 2080, but they priced it at 699. So talking about it in terms of like it's a prosumer card and it has all this high high bandwidth memory that's available to you for rendering and, and doing GP GPU stuff. But just from a gaming standpoint, people are still waiting for Navi. And if this comes out and it's at RTX 2070 performance levels at the high end, and they were coming out with mid-range first, that means we may see a high end part later. The one thing I don't, I don't know anything about this RDNA architecture. I haven't studied it or been briefed on this yet, Josh, but if, yeah, if nobody, nobody knows anything about RDNA. Yeah, it, it, that was like the huge thing. If they've actually uh, overcome the limitations of GCN, which they refined and refined and refined pretty much to the point where the Radeon 7 is about as good as that's going to get, then if, if RDNA enables them to finally overcome that 64 CU limit, like that 4,096 streaming processor limit, they could come out with some really, really fast GPUs on this architecture. So I'm just, I can't wait to hear details of the architecture and exactly, you know, how efficient it is, how many streaming cores were involved with this RX 5000 series demo, and can they come out with a part that is price performance leader again? But it's all question marks. We have to wait till when, when did know, it's coming GCN up pretty fast. Was it, was it the 5800 series? Was I that thought the first that was the 7000 series? Mm. Was it the 7970 that came yes. out? I think you're right. I think you're right. But yeah, it's it's GCN it's first. long in the tooth. It was good. It was interesting. Yeah. It it had some flexibility. It had some very very CPU like features and functionality. But yeah, it, it got to the point where you just couldn't stack enough of them into a chip and efficiently do anything. So it's going to be interesting to find out about our DNA. If you have any Samsung contacts, yeah. Then you know maybe you know you could find out more about it before the release, but yeah, yeah. no, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna hear about it until later in June, possibly July. And just speaking of that little tease, there we should mention too. We've got it on topic for later, but uh, Josh just can't he can't wait his turn. He's got to keep bringing things up. But yes, Sam's I got him. But you know what? We got to keep it rolling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Huh. So, so uh, it's uh, called it, a uh, segue. Yes. Well, though it's a segue to a different part of my tabs that are all Jim, it's called it's called asynchronous podcasting. Yes, we are that's using, true. <laughs> using all your of branch your prediction is off, Jim. You know, it's, well, it's, it's I tried to patch the of, of consciousness. Yeah. I had to turn off my yeah. my uh multitasking because <laughs> you're gonna have a hell of a time doing the rundown, Jim. I'm sorry. That's all right. But let's just, uh, just, so just be jumping up and down. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I see. There's I so much run... to talk about, and it's all interconnected. It is. Yeah. There's going to have to be a seizure warning on this podcast, Jim. We're, but we're weaving a tapestry of technology. Yep. That's yep. beautiful. I mean, now the, carry the, on with the AMD RDNA. Right. So speaking yeah. of flexibility of RDNA, uh, Samsung and AMD announced uh, th this week that they're partnering for adding the RDNA. Yeah, structure or what, what do you call it? Pl platform architecture. Architecture. Yeah, to uh, to their mobile to their mobile lineup. So we're you know we're, we're going to see this ranging from your mid to hopefully high end desktop GPUs all the way down to nice, uh, well hopefully well performing mobile graphics chips. So very little details there thus far, but uh, exciting to see that. And there's there's a lot of you know, and I hate to expand this out, but there's a lot of bait there. Are they actually licensing our DNA architecture for mobile? Did AMD actually design our DNA to go down to those power levels? Half a watt, one watt TDP type stuff. Or is Samsung just licensing all that stuff to get an IP umbrella over their current designs that they have been working on for about the last seven years that have not yet come to fruition? Otherwise, I mean, they've been using uh, Power VR. They've been using Molly. 
and uh, they they've been developing their own stuff in house for a while. But IP is a big thing. I mean, ask Qualcomm, ask Apple, how many millions and billions of dollars have they spent on on that crap? Uh, Intel, same thing. You know, they've had cross licensing with uh, Nvidia, and people thought, well, you know, we're going to see Nvidia graphics Intel. No, it's it's we're using their IP to have an umbrella over our design. So it's nobody knows what Samsung is doing with with the RDNA stuff. Uh, it'd be cool if AMD got back into the ultra mobile space with cell phones and SOCs. Uh, because they sold off uh, the Imagion group to Qualcomm back in 2008, 2009, and yep. they had the Adreno products since then. And uh, you know they've they've regretted that because who knew that you know back in 2008 that mobile would be as big as it is in terms of graphics as it is now. I mean, you can play stinking Fortnite and PUBG on your phones with. A shockingly little amount of of optimization to get it to run. Um, so yeah, it's the, yeah. This is another topic we could spend a tremendous amount of time on because we just don't know what Samsung's doing. We don't know how low AMD's RDNA can go in terms of of, of power consumption and how powerful it can be. So yeah, it's it. This is going to be an exciting six months in terms of just graphics, CPU, everything. I'm excited, as you can tell. And, and we'll have more, at least in terms of desktop graphics, uh, as we mentioned, next uh, week. I guess is that is the 10th Sunday? Monday? What is that? Uh, Monday. Monday. So this coming Monday at E3, I guess E3 doesn't officially start till Tuesday, but uh, AMD's having their event Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, and... Sebastian will be there, so stay tuned. We'll have Hello. more more from AMD there. And I think we'll have more from NVIDIA as well. NVIDIA is going to have some stuff going on as well. Um, so That's so the we'll, rumor. Yeah, we'll see see how that goes. Um, uh, we we kind of skipped over it, I think. But let's really quickly talk about RX 570 compatibility. Uh, because this was uh, one of the you know one of the selling points that AMD uh, talked about for a long time about you know you don't need a new motherboard uh, to upgrade to new generations of Ryzen and so we've got these you know, three generations of uh, uh, platforms of, of chipsets and boards and there's some level of cross compatibility there but uh, tell tell us Jeremy what what uh, what's the, the the key takeaway here from this uh, matrix that. Honestly, there. If you're sitting with a motherboard and a system that's perfectly stable, and you're looking at one of these new Ryzen processors, something and that would be freaking sexy to have. You might as well go grab it. Uh, like unless you went for one of the really older generations, like the A320, which you know you probably bought at a, a bargain bin sale for eighteen dollars. Uh, you are going to be able to run the the newest generation of Ryzen processors. Now, I apologize for not remembering that when PCIe 3.0 came out, there was this huge discussion about, oh, well, obviously the, the older generation processors are going to be compatible with it uh, because it didn't specify that, well, no, your, your first or second gen Ryzen processor is, is not suddenly going to be able to speak PCIe 4.0. That, that seems a little unreasonable, and if you run into somebody who's selling you a modded BIOS that's going to let you do it, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but y you might want to think twice about it, because it, it, it's just silly. But it will be AM4. It will be completely cross-compatible, uh, except for, as you can see up there, the newest X570s, you know, that first-generation you're probably going to need to get rid of uh if it's got the graphics chip in it you might be able to get away with it but chances are at that point with your your several year old processor you're sort of looking at the lower end of the third gen and saying well that's got more cores and threads than the highest gen of the first gen that i bought or the highest tier of the first gen that i bought so it, it's just amazing how compatible these are so that the chip is just going to be, for the most part, a drop-in upgrade. 
and away you go. And you, you saw the price points earlier. Uh, you know, five hundred dollars pretty much for the top of the line. It makes it really, really attractive. There, there's not going to be unless you've opted for one of the the lower end wraith coolers, uh, for instance. You're probably not even going to have to replace your heat sink. Just pop her off. It's about time you change your thermal paste, anyways. Come on, be honest. Pop in the new processor, slap on some new paste, heat sink, and away you go. Uh, if you got the X370 or the B350. You might want to flash uh, the UAFI to the newest version before you do that. Although, to be honest, at this point, you might want to check anyways. There's some nasty stuff out there that is even affecting AMD. It's just lovely to see that AMD is making it dead simple to upgrade to a new processor. And you're really not going to have to invest a lot of money in doing it. So if you're looking at upgrading, I... It's not that long before we're going to see these guys. On the other hand, if you want to go the other way, well, I want to get a brand new chipset. That's, or I want to get a new uh, motherboard that's got PCIe 4.0, but I can't quite afford to get both. Well, don't worry. Your second gen Ryzen is going to work in there just fine. You can do that upgrade next. Or if you've got the uh, first gen, uh, as I said before, I thought I'd upgraded updated the chart but apparently i haven't uh the, the first gen ryzen processors with radian graphics are supported so that the, there should be a little tick there uh mm. apologize dr sue uh, <laughs> yep absolutely so, yeah, you, you have the note there but the chart's still out of date but uh, yeah i could have sworn i'd uh, grab their new chart that's right well we're clarifying it officially here um yes and, and also speaking of motherboards, uh, one of the issues with Ryzen and uh, Threadripper, of course, as well, those, those first Zen-based launches was lack of board choices. And that is uh, looking like it's not going to be a problem at all. All the major manufacturers have announced X570 boards, Asus, ASRock, Biostar, colorful Gigabyte MSI, tons of choices. They were all on display at Computex, uh, all kinds of feature sets and uh, sizes going all the way down to... Uh, um, uh, mini ITX. So a lot of choices for some really interesting builds there and uh, just need to make sure all the firmware is all, all good and, and uh, stability is good. And, and also that, that everyone, including AMD can ship all these parts in volume. So two, two things though, one, one I'm going to ask you about, <clears throat> have they talked about price of, of these motherboards? I didn't see any specific pricing in any of the boards I talked to, although I imagine with the price of the processors, they're going to be more reasonable because it's, they don't want to, if you've got a, if you've got a good, a, a decent price processor, it's, and yet your, your top of the line chipset boards are all as much as the processor that tends to throw consumers off, you know, when they're making, yeah, them. I, you know, I, I guess I've, I've heard a couple of rumors that we're really not going to see anything very much below 200 bucks for a motherboard. Mm, yeah. I think that's, that's alarming. It's alarming yet reasonable because you, you know, have plenty of full featured X470 boards, uh, B450 boards that offer a lot of stuff. But if you want PCIe 4.0, <clears throat> you're going to pony up. And even the lowest end boards that I was looking at, it's like, you know, their bill of materials is up there and you're going to be looking at, you know, I, I would say that we may see them as low as a 175, but you're not going to see yeah. the $125 X570 board. No. Yeah. And, and, and well, if you flick back to the, the picture of the motherboards, you will notice they all have one thing in common. RGB. of well, well that active, yeah, active cool. I was yeah, being yes. colorblind. Thank you very oh, much. Well, uh, sorry. But because got, Jeremy, you know, Gigabyte, you know, <laughs> I'll jump in here. Gigabyte does have a non-active <laughs> cooling. Oh, but it is so. It, I mean, it's got heat pipes around that are around. You know, the the eight ninety FX type series boards, which were ludicrous because the whole thing was just producing so much heat. Um. So they've got one that looks like it does not have a fan, but yeah, the 
not the PLX, I can't think of the name, but the 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 PCI 4.0 complex <clears throat> is really I mean it produces a lot of heat. Like as we talked about with the uh with the PCI 4.0 SSDs and the Fizon controller, that's an 8 watt TDP part. And so you're looking at a chipset that's going to be doing 12 to 15 watts TDP. And it's going to need active cooling when things are under load. So if you're doing a tremendous amount of, of, of IO work using PCI 4.0, then that chip is going to get really, really hot. And yes, you need active cooling on that and we're going back to that because physics is a really rough nasty thing to bump your head against because it's unyielding and this is this is the case they've done as well as they could but it's going to be hot and you're either going to have to have a tremendous amount of metal and a way to you know wick that heat away or you're going to have to have some kind of cooling and all of them have except for like one or two, they all have active cooling because in worst case scenario, if you're hammering a PCI 4.0 drive, that chipset is going to be motoring. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, looking at it from that perspective, though, and looking at how all the, you know, if you're a price con- conscious building, you're building a system and, and price, you have a hard price limit. So you're not, you know, the, the, x570 boards wherever they do end up are out of your range you're probably not going to go out and be able to afford pcie 4.0 storage right i mean because that's well, what if be... you buy a uh what if you buy a, a an rx 5700 the mm-hmm. first gpu out that will support pcie 4.0 and you want that check mark and well, okay if you do then that's fine and, and those cars will be probably more affordable but you won't see any real world performance difference there for yeah, now no. Oh, well, yeah. What if I stick it in like a four lane PCIe slot and I'm like matching the mat, the 16X of the uh, third gen? There you go. There you go. Well, Apple's got something for you. But, um, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> but yeah, so I, th- I think in terms of if you are, I mean, obviously, you always want things to be cheaper, but if you are uh, limited by price, as Jeremy was saying, AMD has made it easy. Go buy that um, 470 board now, get the features you want, save some money it with your Ryzen or your Zen 2 Ryzen processor and then uh, in a year or however however long it takes for for component costs to come down on, on PCI 4 and uh, X570 then you can just swap the board same yep. processor no problem I mean obviously you got to get in your system and move stuff around but uh you know that helped by then the uh, the new SSD should be affordable too that's true exactly yeah. so there, there's there's gonna be, and hopefully actually, there will be yeah. other controllers out there Yes, yes. That's exactly, and and other devices, maybe new device categories, even who knows. So, uh, a lot of a lot of options there. You, you know, you're not going to be handcuffed, uh, so to speak, if if you can't go all state of the art right out of the gate. So, so follow me here. What if Logitech makes a PCI 4.0 based mouse with a 150,000 k polling rate? You don't. You don't have the I hair sense, for I that. Se- I sense an old, <laughs> entirely un, unexplored uh, market here. I'll, they can I'll, do it uh, with PCI for. I, I just reached for my mouse, and it, it's now three provinces over. So I mean, yeah, maybe not a good idea. <laughs> uh, well, I am seeing Logitech next month. I think so. We'll see. I'll ask them. Hey, I'll ask good them. I'll question. Sure the score you can get on Slap the Monkey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I score high every or, day. Or <clears throat> how many instances of those auto clicker apps you can run on that 12 core Ryzen processor? Yeah. But all right, so uh, Are you, you're going to Switzerland to meet with them? Jim? No, 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 no. Just California. Oh, uh, okay. But yeah, no, 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 nothing, nothing huge. Um, Say hi uh, to Josh. Uh, I will. I will. Hi, Josh. But. Um, also, real quick, let's just mention that uh, Threadripper, because we talked about that on the last show, in terms of what its feature would be. And AMD didn't have any specific announcements about Threadripper, except that Lisa Sue did uh, state, and then I also asked again about it in our private meetings about it, and they were uh, very um, uh, emphatic about the uh, their commitment to Threadripper. They are absolutely committed. We, are there. we will see more Threadripper. They don't have anything to announce yet, but Threadripper as a product category is not dead, so they say right now. And so we'll 
We'll see. Mm. And uh, and I, I brought up that's right, Josh. Jim. I, that's right, Jim. I, Currently, it is not dead. You can still buy them. They are uh, still being made. What I mean is, 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 is they specifically said that there will be future Red Ripper products, not just that the current one models. One day, Josh. One day. But I did Maybe. ask them, I said, you know, I said, you know, you, Josh made a good point during our last show about how Epic and Ryzen are now squeezing the uh, a market for Threadripper from both sides coming, you know, uh, approaching there. And, and they they said that was a good point. And uh, yet, and that might become something in the future that, that, that they would think about. But for now, Threadripper has a future, at least one more iteration. Uh, we just don't know the timing or details on that, so... Uh, all right. Um, it's shitty that they were finally got three good names for processors and they're thinking about getting rid of one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Let's how about Athlon? Let's bring back Athlon, but make it like Athlon. Well, they, well, did, they already have Athlon, Athlon back. seven, right? But like a high end Athlon. Oh, okay. Well, Let's go back to like the Athlon, you know, the like the 3800 plus and the 4800 plus. Like equivalent numbers instead of clock speeds. Well, again. considering the way naming schemes are going nowadays, I wouldn't be surprised, Sebastian. Yeah, like the new Intel parts that are like one zero zero zero, you know, six five or something. Yeah, it's yeah. going to take a lot of getting used to. All right. Uh, anybody else have anything on AMD before we move on? Nope. Okay. So uh, next up, we had more processor stuff, and Josh went to England to meet with ARM, and they uh, they briefed him there and then made their official announcement at Computex on their latest uh, CPU, GPU, and uh, machine learning components. So, Josh, take it away. You know, maybe I should have <clears throat> actually prepared for this podcast. Oh, well, I mean, Why what's ruin the tradition? No, anyway, um, you know what? We've we've got multiple new products coming from ARM, and uh, they will not be arriving this year, but we will be seeing them next year. As you know, <clears throat> the cadence that ARM has been doing for lately has been really, really good. So last year's A76 parts are now showing up in new products, uh, such as Qualcomm has adopted that for, you know, the... the uh, I can't remember what stinking Cairo they call it, but it's in the Galaxy S10, uh, the U.S. version. Um, We have others that are using the A76, and it was a high-performance part. We're seeing it now. Well, the A77 has been announced, and it is an even higher performance part, and we're looking at the 15 to 18% increase in IPC running at around the same core speed so 2.7 to 3 gigahertz and uh you know these are all uh designed to be used on the the first generation seven nanometer parts and also the second generation seven seven nanometer parts uh ipc the increase is impressive and if we've looked back past the best in the last five years for arm they have been very very consistent in increasing the performance of their parts not just in, in gigahertz, but also in how much work they're able to do without really breaking the TDP envelopes that, that we see from mobile parts, so which means less than 5 watts uh, and typically around 2.5 watts because they think that you know around 4 watts and above, the devices just get too uncomfortable to hold. I mean, it's just too hot. You can't hold it against your face. Your, your fingers start tingling whatever but this is a significant uplift for a refresh part because a76 was released last year and it was a new generation part it was a new microarchitecture that was uh, built by the austin folks and a77 is is the refresh but the amount of changes they've made in that is is truly impression the the front end I mean, it's it's got a new, uh, what they call a mop cache. It's a micro op, yeah, micro op cache, where previously decoded operations that you know, like instructions that have been turned to micro ops, are stored there. So instead of the decode unit going through and saying, "Hey, I received this instruction, let's decode this into a couple of micro ops and then dispatch it to." the execution cores 
uh, it's all stored here in the the micro op cache, and so it's faster, it consumes less power, and it's a win win, and it takes up die space. But you're just so much faster. I mean, uh, branch prediction again improved. They've increased the size of a lot of buffers at the front end, and they've now gone from a four dispatch decode to a six dispatch decode so they can dispatch six instructions well or six you know micro ops to the execution cores and they've also increased those as well and so they've they've kind of gone to a wider architecture that doesn't eat a whole lot more power in fact you know about the same amount and if you're using an advanced uh uh, process technology it's it's consuming less power but it's faster and it's significantly faster and they've readjusted how it talks to caches and they've readjusted size and they've made greater flexibility in the size and so partners can take a look at this and say you know we've got uh, uh, certain tdp needs we can adjust, you know, size of the caches because caches tend to use more power than pretty much any other part because they're always kind of powered on. And just the architecture is is really flexible. It's turned into something pretty powerful. I mean, if, if you look at single threaded IPC, they're around kind of Intel levels. When you start getting into multi-threaded, they, they fall down a lot just because... Some of the internal architecture is is not, I mean, it's efficient and it's low power, but you just can't transfer that much data and, and have that much communication without paying a price. And Intel is happy to pay that price at, you know, 65 to 95 watt TDP, but ARM is not at that pace, at that place. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a really interesting increase in, in performance. And I mean, they're just, doing this at regular intervals and it's really kind of impressive because like i said earlier um you know like fortnite and PUBG, well not sorry yeah fortnite and PUBG were has fortnite no okay fortnite is on mobile but is PUBG? i thought it uh, was. yes it is yeah okay anyway they did pretty limited optimizations to get those to run on arm products on your stinking cell phones. And here's, you know, you're you're playing Fortnite on your computer, which has a 65 watt TDP CPU. It's got 115 to a 260 watt GPU. And you're running that on a mobile device that has a pretty high resolution. And it it just runs without a huge amount of optimizations. I mean, they were able to port them there with a relatively limited amount of, you know, work hours as compared to getting something to really run well on that architecture. I mean, ARM has just done amazing. So uh, they've also <clears throat> released the Molly G77, which is a two totally new ARM microarchitecture. It's the Valhalla. Valhalla architecture it's, it's an improvement from it, no it's Valhall but it's an improvement from the Bifrost and they've totally re I mean it's it, it's it's brand new it's really super efficient they made a lot of really interesting optimizations uh a lot of of changes in there and um, I'm trying to think of the world word, and and of course it's it's not coming to me. Um, anyway, they've they've taken some functionality, not so much functionality away, but there's some performance in certain workloads that is not as good at. But then they focused the other parts of the uh, of the architecture to be better at other workloads so uh, machine learning is improved with these um a lot of the other you know more commonly used advanced graphics uh capabilities have all been improved and they've 
just changed everything. I mean, it, I mean, you'll really need to go and, and kind of read through what I wrote about it because I mean, it is a, a total re-architect of how they have done their graphics core. And it is more efficient in like 95% of the workloads that people see than the previous generation. I mean, there are a couple of corner cases where it's not as good. You know, instead of like, you know, 12 megapixels or something, it's getting eight. But it's not in stuff that is as important for users. And uh, so this is another, it's like a 20 to 25% improvement uh, running at same clock speeds and, and, and same process technology because they've been really, really smart with how they've re-architected it. And they're uh, working more and more closely with the Kronos group to make sure that uh, Vulcan is is really tightly supported. So they don't have to have a whole lot of, of uh, extraneous stuff to kind of decode Vulcan instructions to make it work with with Molly. I mean, it's it's very close to the metal with Vulcan, which you know Vulcan is close to the metal anyway. But it's it's you know it's it's layers of of optimizations that they've done and taken a lot of the middleware out. And it's a really powerful architecture for graphics, and it's very scalable as well. So it's going to be interesting to see in the next year where they go with this, who adopts it. And uh, how it'll compare to, you know, like the the Adreno stuff that uh, Qualcomm's working on. And that's going to be around the time where we may see something from Samsung with their licensing with uh, with AMD. So, you know, yeah. uh, Arm is an aggressive, aggressive company. And they've been farming for this nice, you know, English relaxed, you know, pinky in the air, tea sipping company. I mean, they're they're coming out with boxing gloves and, and they're competing hard and they have a virtual monopoly in cell phones and they're working to get that into laptops and they're working eventually beyond that i mean they're set tops you know roku i think is all arm based um there's no place up but up for this company and uh their products they're released with with the a77 the g77 the D77, which is new uh, uh, display port display unit, which has more VR type uh, applications added to it, and then their machine learning processing, which uh, something like they they can do five tera ops at one watt. I mean, it's just an insane amount of compute that they can do in their hand. The edge machine learning is is something they're really aiming at. So again, you know, read the uh, read the article. It's a lot more information in there. Uh, Arm is is going places. They've been going places for ages. They've got a monopoly on cell phones. They're working on tablets. They're working on laptops. There's a lot of good stuff going on there. And speaking of laptops, we don't have it on the uh, list today, but uh, Qualcomm at Computex announced their or they they announced it last December when Ken right before he quit. Let, went to Hawaii, which I still hold against him. But the 8CX, uh, the the uh, high-end uh, Snapdragon ARM-based l- processor for laptops, and the initial performance uh, benchmarks on that thing are pretty impressive. It is beating an i5 in certain workloads. Uh, so, yes, yeah, and it's really a five-watt TDP part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just it's just ludicrous what the amount of performance you can get. And they hey, they released a 7CX as well, kind of a lower end uh, recently as well. But, yeah, I mean, I'd love to get my hands on that because, you know, guys like Firefox have ARM64 native applications that run on on Windows 10, yep. running on ARM. And I, I and had some meetings. works. Uh, right, I had some meetings with, with Microsoft uh, off the record, you know, over drinks, and they're making some pretty impressive improvements for windows on arm as well so it's, it's a it's and obviously apple's doing its thing couldn't get worse yeah well <laughs> that's true uh then they knew that they i didn't need me to tell them that but um yeah so some exciting stuff happening there and uh, again as josh mentioned uh do read his review he wrote a very detailed uh, uh write-up of all this information check it out at pcpro.com and uh if you're new to the to the show 
Uh, all of our articles are in our show notes and you can find those at pcpro.com slash podcast. So, uh, you know, don't, don't worry. Don't worry about jotting down a link or, or make, taking notes. You'll find all the links for all of our shows there. And, uh, and yeah, so that's, that's great. We'll, uh, be paying more attention in the coming year to arm, uh, lots of exciting stuff happening in low power, uh, in the low power space. Um, but, uh, really quick, let's uh, take a real quick break. We've got a, uh, an ad, uh, a, a sponsor this week. And they're back. Uh, they are awesome. It is Captera. Now, we've talked about Captera before. If you have a business, you need software. I mean, there's pretty much no business out there where you can't benefit from software. And sometimes, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of common software, word processors and email stuff and database and stuff like that. Sometimes it's more specific. It's more, adva- uh, more, more, more tailored to your business. Things like uh, uh, stuff for medical offices, churches, real estate agents. And, you know, there's software out there, but how do you find it? And when you do find it, how do you evaluate it? How do you know if it's good? And there's always reviews, but those reviews can't necessarily be trusted all the time. You don't know, you know, are, are they, are they up to date? You know, is it a review talking about a product version that's six generations old or something? Where do you go to find it? And the answer now is Captera, because Captera is the leading free. And I really want to stress that free because there's absolutely no cost to you to use it free online resource to help you find the best software solutions for your business. They have over 875,000 reviews. And I think that's over 900,000. I think that graphics out of date. I think it's over 900,000 reviews of business software from real users, verified reviews, and it's everything you need to make an informed decision for software for your business. There's over 700 categories of software. Uh, as we looked at last week, uh, I think, or the last time they were on, I think uh, I asked for some recommendations. Uh, uh, Brett uh, suggested uh, shoe shoe shiner or something, and they didn't have shoe shiner. Okay, so fair enough. But they have software for podiatry offices, so it's that specific. It's stuff for lawn care, uh, like I said, churches and nonprofits, lawyers, architects, uh, manufacturing, customer relationship management software, delivery software. Seven hundred categories to take to, to browse and, and search, and then when you do find the software in the category you need. They've got beautiful layout describing what kind of software it is. Is it a free software? Is it a perpetual license? Is it a subscription license? Uh, does it, uh, you know, in terms of when, if there is a cost, how much is it? What's the range of cost? What the, what the compatibility, operating system compatibility? Does it, does it have a mobile app? Is it web-based? All this stuff is categorized for you so you can easily browse and compare. And then you can go into each uh, application and see real reviews from real users. So you can know what's good, not only what's good, but is it something that's going to meet your needs? And so not only do you find what you need, you find it fast, you make your business better, your, run, your business can run better, your customers are happy, your employees are happy. It's a great resource. So check it out. Like I said, it's completely free. No account creation needed, no cost, no credit card trial, nothing like that. Just go to capterra.com slash PCPer. That's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash PC per. And like I said, because it's free, you, you could just go to captera.com. But if you go to captera.com slash PC per, that lets you, lets them know you found them through us and it helps us out. So we'd appreciate that. The leading free online resource to help you find the software for your business, captera.com slash PC per. C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash PC per. Go find some great software, make your business run better. We thank Captera for their support of the PC Perspective podcast. All right, thank back you. to the show. Let's uh, wrap up Computex here because we're going quite long. So uh, another minor, well, not minor, but another announcement that NVIDIA had at Computex. And certainly was, not low powered. Not low powered for this. And uh, <laughs> and because NVIDIA didn't have any, uh, any huge you know, major product announcements, you know, they, they, they got Quadro RTX and the laptops and stuff. And, and related to that is this new, uh, new studio initiative, I guess you can call it. It's it, just like Intel is working with partners for Athena. Uh, NVIDIA is, is working with its partners to launch this studio series of laptops that are basically meant to take on the MacBook Pro, at least the, even in their marketing, they're specifically calling out the MacBook Pro in terms of performance, battery life, capabilities, I.O., uh, so so all kinds of areas that they're going after. And, and their whole thing is, you know, professionals like MacBook Pros. And for the design, you know, historically the reliability, maybe not so much anymore, 
Uh, but but they are they're thermally they're, they're underpowered for the price. They're thermally limited because of Apple's design choices, and they don't have NVIDIA graphics cards in them for sure. Uh, so this is the Studio series is, is NVIDIA's partnering with with their you know ASUS and Acer and, and companies like that to to have a, a class of laptops powered by NVIDIA RTX and Quadro you know Turing based uh, products that are tuned for creatives, tuned for graphics, graphic design, video editing, photo editing. And, and, and alongside of this studio hardware, there's gonna be studio class drivers that are tuned for professional applications instead of gaming, uh, tuned for stability, things like that. So uh, again, not a huge amount of details on specific models and pricing. They set some, some starting prices. They said, you know, companies like Razer, Asus, Dell, Gigabyte, HP, MSI, they'll have products starting at $1599 and up. And they did announce some specific models, but again, no, no pricing for all of these yet. But uh, you look at them and, and there's some some nice designed uh, uh, products, some interesting designs. Uh, if you're watching the video version, here's an Acer with the, the, the they sh Acer showed this off at their concept event, but here's an Acer, here's another look at it with the, uh, the tilting screen so that it can uh, lay flat down for drawing. Um, here's a, 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 a what is that? Uh, Arrow. What company is that? Arrow? Unknown. Unknown. I'm familiar with them, but okay. Uh, Alienware, of course. Uh, Dell's Alienware, Asus, MSI. So these are going to be laptops, you know, specifically marketed, designed, priced, and bundled with software features and stuff for professionals. So Bas we'll yeah, basically mobile, they have, you know, the two variants, there's going to be Quadro, there's going to be RTX. These are mobile workstations. But if you remember a couple months ago, this creator ready driver launched and you could use, you know, your existing graphics card it doesn't have to be a professional level graphics card, but these special drivers that were tuned to give you like more blender cycles, better performance in Adobe CC, et cetera. And maybe they weren't going to be released at the same cadence as the, 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 drivers for gaming, but they were going to be a solid choice for doing like prosumer type work with your GPU that's been renamed. And so this studio driver program is the new name for the creator ready driver. So these laptops are being, you know, released with that version of the driver, even if it's an RTX laptop. So theoretically you could install a gaming driver and maybe game on these things if you really wanted to, but these are all about you know, like you were talking about, this is productivity machines. And isn't it amazing what you can do when you go with a little bit thicker form factor and you can put real IO back on a laptop and actually have decent thermal performance because you're not trying to make it the thinnest thing. Apple got in their own way when they wanted to make everything look like the MacBook Air. And the, the pro laptop that once was is no more. I remember PC magazines saying, at least one of them pronounced the MacBook Pro the best Windows laptop you could buy a few years ago. That is no longer the case. Yeah, uh, I think I think Walt Mossberg at various points said something similar. <laughs> yeah, um, well, uh, shocking and, and, that Walt and he and, and he is a truly objective. Yeah, yes. yeah, he's a truly objective source. But my, you know, I'm looking at this. I'm an Apple user, as people know. I get some crap from that from our audience, and rightfully so. But I prefer like I prefer Final Cut over Premiere or Avid or any of these other video editing applications. So uh, I prefer, in terms of productivity, I prefer like, uh, I don't know if they still call it this, but Expose, like the window management in, in Mac OS, like- Mission control. Mission control, well. yeah. yeah. Uh, so- I do too, and hot corners, that kind of stuff, that things that you only see in the Linux community or with third-party add-on software, it's nice that it's all built in. The, the built-in PDF support was always mm -hmm. more robust. There's a lot of things about the Mac operating system that are great, and I wish it was something you could install in any hardware, especially now that it runs on Intel. But you know, we've we we aren't even talking about the MacBook or the new Mac Pro announcement on this podcast, but just a beautiful I, operating system that has a lot it of. It is great a nice features. looking cheese grater, oh, right? Yeah. But then beautiful hardware that's not very practical and is often exorbitantly overpriced. But right, but and and my my view from that perspective is. Uh, I'm, I'm a, because I like the software, I'm constantly hating the hardware, whether it's the limited port selection, the thermal throttling, the price, the, the, the performance, just the performance limit, because even though they can put all this hardware in there, it's never going to match a equivalently spec PC because of the thermal issues. So 
Yeah, there aren't even true thermal issues with a lot of these designs because in the firmware, they've made choices about fan speed. So say a fan could spin at 3000 RPM, it's only going to spin at, you know, 1000 or 1200 RPM most of the time because that's how they get the low noise output that they want. Everything is tuned to low noise at Apple. Yeah. Stemming back to when Steve Jobs refused to allow a fan in the box. So if they can make it so that technically you're running like 2C under T junction, that's where it's going to run. You have processors that run 100% of the time at 96C in one of these enclosures when you turn up the fan speeds 400 RPM and they're down to the high 80s, mid 80s. You have a little bit higher, you know, thermal headroom and you can run at higher boost clocks or maybe not kill your system prematurely or running it at 100 degrees all the time. But it has to be low noise. So you, you, you combine extremely low RPMs with very small aluminum enclosures and you, you're never going to get the performance you would out of a traditional PC with the same CPU in it. Yeah. And so you're quick, saying the Apple tissue box was a failure? <laughs> the tissue box. I mean, Do you cube? remember G4? that? Long before the yeah. trash can. Cube? The cube. The G4 yeah. cube, yeah. yes. The completely yeah. the passively cooled. And they put a, it's a power PC processor. Mm -hmm. It's ludicrous. And there are very few of them that still exist that actually fully work. Yeah, but even well, if the, you find one on eBay, because they say that crack the plexiglass. Well, that yeah, yeah, it was one of the problems. Yeah, but uh, uh, real quick, I, I'm just because... amazed at the intestinal fortitude that AMD has shown. Like we we they went from the inort or ornate Threadripper uh, packaging, so yes. Intel one up them with their very intricate uh, Core i9 hexagonal sort of shape. And now AMD is like, you know what? If you want to buy one of our Vega Pro 2s or Pro 2 Duos, we've got a $40,000 package you have to remove to be able to get your hands on that card. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful package. Oh, sure, sure. Um, and we, we, we do have Until a story on that move. in just a minute. But uh, uh, I, I do want to correct uh, that Arrow laptop. I couldn't identify that as a gigabyte laptop, so I apologize. Yeah, it was muted while I said that and laughed. Uh, sorry. Uh, so there's that. Uh, and then also, uh, my, my overall point, though, was is, as compelling as the hardware may be on these studio laptops, if, I, you know, if people are like me and they prefer or need to use software that's only on Mac OS, it doesn't really matter unless you can Hackintosh these things easily. And that's, you know, questionable. We'll see. We'll see how that turns out. But, um, you know, I, I, I just, as Sebastian mentioned, I would wish, I would love for Apple, considering that it's such a small part of the revenue to just release mac os let us easily install it on third-party hardware because uh, i prefer the software hate the hardware so you know steve is that. dead and he was the one who shut down the clones so mm -hmm. you know maybe if tim wasn't following you know all of steve's wishes maybe after tim is gone then then we'll have licensing to, for the os but not as long as they can sell hardware at the kind of margins that they can right now indeed indeed <laughs> yeah all right, so that's the uh, the studio laptop series uh, or program, I guess, uh, from Nvidia and its partners. So check that out. We'll see. We'll see if we can get any of those in and, and take a look and see if there's anything uh, uh, special about them beyond the uh, the optimizations. Uh, speaking, uh, continuing with laptops, Asus had an event on uh, Sunday night, I think it was, or was it Monday night uh, at Computex, and they announced a bunch of stuff. Most interesting uh, of it was this new. ZenBook Pro Duo, which is a hybrid dual screen laptop because we've been seeing, um, who was it? Lenovo came out with their dual screen concept where it's truly two screens. And then obviously, you know, foldable dual screen phones or things and are coming out with Samsung and stuff. Uh, but I, I've well, maybe been, not Samsung. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not, but, um, I've always been wary of the true tool, true, true dual screen because I don't want virtual keyboards and so asus here has has combined the well theoretically the best of both worlds it's a a 15 inch uh regular display uh up to an oled quality display up top and then uh if, if you're if you're listening and you're not able to see the video here i'll try to describe it uh, but check out the website for the pictures of course uh it then comes down to where you'd normally have the top of the laptop and there's a ultra wide 14 inch 
display there. Again, uh, OLED, uh, at least an OLED option across the top. And then the keyboard and numpad and trackpad and all that, that's shifted down. So if you remember the Asus ROZ Zephyrus that we looked at a couple of years ago, where it had the same design, the entire keyboard is shifted right to the front of the chassis, except in that case, it was just blank space back there so they could accommodate higher quality uh, uh, graphics cards, you know, higher, higher thermal load for the components. In this case, they put a display there. And is not, there's nothing true in all that. Um, there's, they were demoing an app where that second display becomes a, a digital keyboard, or like a, 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 sorry, a digital piano keys. So you can you know, learn or, or compose music very interesting pricing is um, still a question for all the options. It's going to be powered by ninth gen i9 processors, so or up to i9 ninth gen. Um, so a very interesting design, and it's the first one I would consider of these so-called dual screen designs. It's the first one I would consider using because it still maintains the physical keyboard. But what do you? Another what do you guys cool think thing that Asus had was pretty much all the new Zen books and Vivo books they were showing. We had a quick post on that too, but the trackpads also have uh, like secondary screen functionality. The yes, it, screen screen pad they call it screen pad two point Yeah, because they, they announced it, that on some products last year, and then now it's it's on everything and it's improved. Yeah, and I I bought an Asus laptop a while back that it was it was getting to the point with the the track pads where it was pretty obvious you're just using like a cell phone digitizer at this point, like a smartphone digitizer. They're using the same form factors as smartphones for a lot of these touch pads. So at some point it made sense. You're going to put a screen behind it. And now you have what is almost like a low cost smartphone below your keyboard that offers you some kind of app functionality or, or secondary display functionality while still providing you with a real keyboard which I would prefer, like that last laptop, these new Zen books and Vivo books. I, I am not ready to go with a completely virtual keyboard on a laptop. I know that a lot of people said the same thing about the iPhone when it came out in 2007, that it's not going to, it's going to fail because it doesn't have a physical keyboard. I think Ryan Block might have been the most famous to pan it back in the day, but obviously that took off and everybody's gotten used to it. And I can type without looking on a phone now with my thumbs, but you know, as much work as we do typing, it's all about the keyboard and then a really quality trackpad and Hey, added functionality. So it's not just blank space, I guess, put the weather on there, but maybe like a baseball game on there or something. Uh, yeah. And I'm, we're showing the, in the video here, we're showing a video of, uh, of what, now this was the first iteration. I, I quickly couldn't find screen pad 2.0, but same basic idea, except that 2.0 has some extra special uh, uh, widget type functionality, a little bit better performance. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's a second display built into your your keypad that you can either like just put a video down there or something, or it can run widgets, calculators, and uh, things like that. So you, know, you, can, you can it can display your your currently playing Spotify track stuff along those lines. So so some interesting stuff. Uh, from Asus. Um, they also had a bunch of 30th, this is their 30th anniversary. They had a bunch of 30th anniversary products. Um, again, we didn't, don't have it here. We'll, we'll talk about it more later. They had a, did, a, a really did, interesting motherboard did, design. Did, did, did Johnny, she show up? Uh-huh. Oh yeah. He it did. Uh, it was intense. Um, their, Thank their, you. Their entire executive um, presentator presenters were screaming at us. Isn't and that they, incredible? They start and and well because and they start off low, they're, they're, and 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 when you you combine the screen into the keyboard, build. it makes it the best. And they build. <laughs> and they build. <laughs> it's um, it was it was painful because the volume in the auditorium was already quite loud, and when they, when they screamed, you know the best Asus, yay! And it was like holy crap, but uh, very excited, very passionate group of executives. Um, yeah, so, uh, so lots to hear from Asus this coming year, uh, both in terms of their ROG brand as well as their like mainline Asus stuff. So, uh, yeah, they really like the number nine, and apparently so does Apple. Oh, okay. I think Apple likes it anyway. more than Asus, though. Yeah, they have more <laughs> nines more in nines. more places. They're a little understated about exclaiming about it, but it's. It's definitely there. 
Mm-hmm. Um, well, speaking of Apple, let's uh, let's finish up the news here. We've got a story. Uh, obviously, Apple had their WWDC keynote this week on Monday, and the headliner of that was, or arguably the headliner was, um, their new Mac Pro, long awaited, long overdue Mac Pro, which returns to a a more traditional tower form factor. Although it, it even though the old one had the nickname Cheese Grater, this one takes it to a whole new level. And part yeah, of that, it's, it's literally a functioning cheese grater now. I think yeah. you could do that yeah. now. Uh, and, and part of that announcement was it, it's the, out of this world. If you look at the uh, very top of the grill, uh, if I look at the top of the what? The grill. Uh, the the top of the grill are little gray alien heads. It's, oh, it's, okay. Once you've seen it, it's slightly disturbing. Looking, well, yeah. Part part of the announcement, the part that probably most uh, closely impacts what we talk about is that AMD continues to be Apple's exclusive graphics partner, and they have announced a, a new series of cards that Apple's calling MPX graphics cards, and uh, these include up to a dual Vega 2 board. So kind of going back to the good old days of those dual GPU cards and What's interesting about this, not only is it the first, the first dual Vega card, and that's dual seven nanometer Vega, uh, but it's it's got this special MPX connector. And if you're watching the video, we've got Apple's uh, product page up here. And so you've got your standard PCIe 3.0 connector because the, the processor is Intel based. It's using Xeon W Cascade Lake based uh, processors, which are not out yet. So they'll be launching probably with this. Uh, so it's PCIe 3.0, you got a standard connector there, but then on the Right behind it is another PCIe looking connector, which they call the MPX connector, which provides, it's, it's just the same, it's almost the same length, I think, as the standard uh, by 16 slot, but it provides 475 watts of power through that connector. So you don't need external power cables for these cards and uh, provides Thunderbolt IO so that you can have your Thunderbolt 3 data and video going out um, through the, uh, the, the standard uh, Thunderbolt 3 ports on the computer. So a very interesting, unique design. Um, let's see if there's some looks. Or you know what's so, more interesting about that? If you scroll back down, mm -hmm. if you the look, Infinity that fabric? that is a PCIe PLX chip. Yeah. That takes yep. the 16 wide PCIe and converts it into two by PCIe 16 to each chip. So not only do we have Infinity Fabric, potentially, or at least so they say, between those two, but it's still a lot of PCIe lanes. Yeah. So very... And HBM2 um, is showing itself off because you don't have to uh, slack off a bit on the memory as we've had, we've seen on other dual G... Dude, dual 64 GPs, gigabytes of card. PCBs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. And uh, you'll see here, this is what it looks like with the cover on installed. So it's a very Apple-like design, you know, kind of slots in, no exposed wires or chips or anything. Um, and of course, we don't know pricing. Pricing is going to be the big question. The system, the Mac Pro itself, starts with an 8-core Xeon W, a Radeon, 580, a Radeon Pro 580X uh, single GPU, uh, which is relatively low-powered uh, GPU. 256 yeah. gigs of storage and 32 gigs of RAM at $59.99. Uh, so God help us when we try to look at configuring these uh, for Max. That's uh, max not a lot of storage, and it's not fast. It's, yeah. 256 yeah. gig of NVMe. It's yeah. I guess they're, they're, yeah. Are they thinking that everybody who buys one of these is going to have a SAN or some uh, external solution? But when you have a big modular enclosure they they've obviously completely retired the so-called trash can where it made sense to have just like a blade storage solution as your exclusive storage but the the, 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 the thing is there'll be add-in cards there'll be people selling like quad ssd add-in boards for these things at you know nice markups but yeah uh, the, and it's got shipping two, configuration at 256 is hilarious at, oh at yeah six thousand well, dollars come on it wouldn't, throw it wouldn't in be a apple card. It wouldn't be Apple if it wasn't ridiculous, uh, but th th there's there's two Apple because Apple's PCIe flash storage does not use standard M.2 connectors. It's a proprietary no, connector. It does not. There's no. two of those on the board, 
So you, you have an option to add more. And then, yeah, yeah as Sebastian said, there'll be PCIe, because there's uh, multiple PCIe Express lane, or PCIe, uh, lane, or, sorry, slots. So you can add yeah, storage eight. that way. It's, it's almost like a real motherboard. There's eight PCIe slots on this board. Yeah, let's see. Here's a, there's a picture of it here somewhere. There's a, there's a better one. Where is it? Come on. Find it. There we go. Look at that. And a socketed CPU, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll be able to add storage that way. Uh, our companies have already uh, announced modules that kind of tie into the top here and screw in where those screws are. You can add uh, hard drives because there's two exposed SATA ports here and a, a breakout power connector, USB connector. So there's there's some, you know, Apple did, did have, they certainly have more options for expandability than they've, they've ever had, or at least not in, in years and in, in decades. Um, so there's going to be some options there for, for people interested in expanding. It's just a question of software support because you can put a aftermarket GPU in here. They said there will be support for adding external power cables, but you can't do NVIDIA because there's no support for NVIDIA, um, anything newer than Maxwell in the uh, latest versions of Mac OS. So, so yeah, we'll see. I don't even want to touch there's, the there's 10, still 000, the mad about those stand. MacBook Pros, aren't they? Oh yeah, they are. They are. So um, we'll we'll see uh, if we can somehow get one of these to test. Uh, I doubt Apple will sample them. Um, you don't think my, so? Come on, maybe not to not, us. They're definitely not to us. Not, that, that's what I meant. That not to us. Uh, my my son doesn't need to go to college, right? Um, no, no. no. Well, I mean, he he doesn't need to go to college because when you buy him this twelve thousand dollar workstation. He will bypass that and just become like the next, you know, it filmmaker. He'll be the next J.J. Abrams before of he's course. even finished with high school. Yeah. Absolutely, you, you I just would, give I him would, the tools and let him fly. I would, I would hope for nothing less. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that as details come out on on exactly what's going on with those AMD cards and uh, and how they perform, uh, whether or not we can get our hands on them. I am the god of hellfire, and I Are bring you, you Diablo. Diablo hellfire, hellfire for free. Come on. Now, yeah, Sierra. Some... Somebody <clears throat> doesn't know who Arthur Brown is. No, sorry. It's a pity. You're, but there is there's out. an interesting story here, though, right? This this is not just an average. This is not your typical DLC or add-on, or I guess you would call it back then an expansion pack for for Diablo. Oh, no. There's some something unique about this, right, guys? Oh, Josh has got it. Yeah, it was made by Sierra. And uh, it was kind of official, but not really. Yeah. It that was, was a funny bizarre, part, but, but it, it worked a... really well. It was a, it was a great, uh, great expansion. Yeah. Synergistic Software was the house that actually made it. Obviously, it was released through Sierra. But it's interesting that with this deal that GOG has with Blizzard, that they are bringing over the unofficial uh, expansion to the official re-release of the game through GOG. So that's cool. And of course, as Jim alluded to, this is free. Like anybody who, who bought this on GOG already is added to your downloads or you, I don't know how it works with GOG Galaxy. I assume that it just updates the game to add the option for the expansion when you boot it up. But, you know, and to kind yeah. of date this expansion, <clears throat> Look at the back of the CD. Oh, wow. Seal the portal or seal your fate. Half-Life. Not even Sierra. Orange Box. Not even. Wow. I'm so old. Christ, if I got up, I could probably find it just behind me, too. Well, it it, it, uh, it carries over oh, the improvements. Sit a while. <laughs> right. They... Uh, as we talked about with the initial Diablo launch on GOG, it has uh, uh, options for a higher res mo mode, although there's some question about whether that, you know, smooths it to the point of, of non-authenticity. Non uh, but it, it, uh, it, it works one-click installation, works on Windows 10. So, and, and, and if you've already bought it, it's part of your package. And if not, I think it's on sale for 10% off uh, currently uh, as part of the Are you going to say, purchase. were you trying to say, Stay a while. And listen. And listen. He was. Thank you, Discount Sean Connery. Yeah. Discount Sean Connery. 
It wasn't so, bad. No, it wasn't. It was lovely. There was some pretty so, good voice acting in that game. Yep. So something to check out for sure. Uh, Diablo over at GOG with the Hellfire expansion, which uh, was it's a surprise. Totally worked it. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, let's finish up. Are we the, almost done? Uh, we're almost done. Yep, let's finish up the news real quick. Uh, Seagate is now shipping 16 terabyte uh, drives to consumers. They've been shipping these to enterprise, like direct sales to enterprises for a while now. But now you can go out and you can buy 16 terabyte capacities, uh, both in their enterprise targeted, like, is it Exos, however you pronounce that, E-X-O-S. So the Exos X series for, you know, high demanding enterprise workloads, uh, but also in their Iron Wolf series, both the Iron Wolf Iron Wolf Pro and regular Iron Wolf. Uh, they're the uh, 16 terabyte capacities. The prices, uh, the at least the MSRPs, the Exos uh, is 630 or so. Uh, the uh, 630 for the SATA and 640 for the SAS version. The Iron Wolf Pro is 665 and the non pro Iron Wolf is 610. So if you need. Uh, you need density in your storage. There you go. That's uh, the I think the only commercially like consumer available 16 terabyte drive on the market thus far. Yes. And there was some question with reliability and uh, and Seagate. You know, obviously they had a period a few years ago, and I was bit by that as well. But I've been running um, 10 terabyte Iron Wolves, non pro Iron Wolves, for a couple of years now, and haven't had a single problem. So. Uh, Knock on wood. Yeah, but looking at Backblaze numbers, they've gotten way better with reliability. Yeah. Black, Backblaze runs a lot of Seagate drives, and the failure rates are not that high. I love them because you don't really have to pay for the results. And they use a yeah. lot of hard drives. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else have any news to talk about before we go into Pixel Week? No? Good. Okay. Josh is ready to go. No, Josh does. No, please. It's after midnight on the East Coast as we are recording this. Yeah. Okay, so picks of the week. Uh, mine quickly is the Anchor PowerCore 26800 PD. It's a portable battery. These are obviously everywhere, but this one I've been using for a couple trips now, and it really came in handy on the long trip to Taipei. Um, it's a, uh, a 2680 or 26,800 milliamp hour capacity. So that's the maximum capacity you can carry on an airplane uh, legally, I guess, according, according to TSA regulations. It's got two USB type A ports and a USB type C, which can do 30 watts of uh, power to devices. So I like had my iPad Pro charging in my backpack at the airport during one of my canceled flights, and it got me back up to 100% and still had room to, uh, to spare on the battery. So this is, if you're looking for a, a really good high capacity one, it's not cheap, it's under 30 bucks, but it's, it's the quality thus far over, I've used it, I think on three trips now, and it's been really, really good. Works well, a lot of capacity, uh, not too big, not too too heavy considering the capacity. So uh, check that out. Anchor PowerCore Plus 26800 power delivery model. All right. And um, next is Jeremy. What have you got for us here? Well, this is, uh, you know, kind of amusing. Uh, NASA is uh, doing a little thing where if you just literally put in your first name, last name, country, post code, and email. They will carve your name into uh, a tiny little piece of metal uh, at about, uh, I'm guessing, 100 nanometers, maybe 70 nanometers in size. On a piece of metal they're sending to Mars. So, seriously, why the hell not? You, you can put a little <laughs> bit of your own graffiti on mars it, it it's kind of amusing it's not going to cost you anything and you know we've hit the point where you know a, a laser that can etch at 75 millimeter or nanometers yeah we're just going to scribble stuff on it because we can Ooh, there you go it's done it's happening nice. and if that ain't tech i don't know what is that's official put that in a poster Oh yeah. All right. Next up, we've got Josh. What do we got for us? I'm I sure a plastic bag. But them. you know what? I was speechless when I found a thousand pet waste plastic bags that are 
oxidizable, I believe. So, you know, they, they, yeah, coilless bags don't leave any waste. Eventually, they will go away after a couple of years. But, you know, a thousand of them for 15 bucks. And if you apply all the little extras, it's like, you know, I paid 10 bucks and I got two day shipping. So, you know what? If you need poop bags, this is this is a great deal. Is I'm not going to have to worry about poop bags. Some other application. It's flexible. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so anyway. with a podcast of this length, I would appreciate a bag. And this know. quality. Mm-hmm. Sometimes volume is, you know, you have to have a thousand bags to cover it all. That's the benefit of emptying beer bottles and then leaving them right next to you during the podcast. Yeah. Be careful when you stand up. Yeah, I've got, I've got, you know, the, the bad yeah, thing is, over you know, the, the tabs don't knock, don't and the, uh, the aluminum, uh, you know, areas. You gotta be it's careful. Just, you gotta be you careful. Gotta that, be yeah, careful. that hurts. It can hurt. Yeah. You want the glass Practice. bottle because it's sort of rounded. You don't want to deal with metal, <laughs> the sharp edges. No, you want to go for a mason jar. Nice wide. Well, yeah. I mean, ideally. Yeah. But. All right. Sebastian. Cheap storage. Uh, I posted a quick thing about Samsung SM961. These are NVMe SSDs from like 2016. It was basically the OEM version of the 960 Pro. Very fast drive. You are losing magician software support. So you don't have the ability to go in and do things like enabling hardware encryption. So don't use this with BitLocker or something. Use it for just a vanilla OS or just something where you want really fast access. There's nothing wrong with three gigabytes per second reads, and this will still do about 1400 megabytes per second writes, even though it's a very small capacity drive by today's standards of 256 gigabytes. And NVIDIA's sale ends tomorrow on these, or NVIDIA, did I say NVIDIA? Newegg sale ends tomorrow on these, but Amazon lowered the price. So just 39.99 every day for the time being for one of these. And if you haven't jumped on the NVMe bandwagon and you've got an M.2 slot on your motherboard, this is big enough to run your OS on. I bought one of these myself a couple of years ago just from some OEM reseller on eBay, pretty cheap. Not this cheap, but it was a very good boot drive for a while for me until I could get a bigger one. So very, very good performance and, and just the trend in general for cheap NVMe drives. We've seen already M.2 drives that are SATA that are inexpensive in lower capacities, but you know, thirty to forty dollars is there's just no excuse not to have something if you've got like thirty or forty bucks. I mean, three thousand megabytes a second. Anyway, it's and available. Don't, don't forget, I think that uh, that six sixty p was it that uh, the Intel uh, QLC drive for one terabyte is still about a hundred bucks too. So if you've got a little yeah. bit more, I mean, you could you budget. could boot off the Samsung and then store on the uh, Intel. I, I mm-hmm. think the Intel doesn't have quite the speed, but it's a newer drive and it would support more features than that older Samsung OEM drive. Yeah, sure. the Intel will have faster cached writes, but limited to the yeah. cache. So yeah, but right, there's some good. stuff you can do in the Intel toolbox, which is nice. I got to play around with that. We didn't even talk about Optane. There's a new Optane memory uh, that was announced at that uh, Computex. But, That's right. Yep. Yeah, so uh, just, they're they're finally going to four lanes instead of two, so they have faster yeah. throughput, lower latency. Well, on that note, uh, as as we said, uh, at the jump beginning on of the, the show, electronic super highway, right? Uh, we we certainly didn't cover everything. No, can we jump off it? <laughs> but uh, uh, there's there's uh, so much that went on the last uh, week and a half. If there's a story from Computex or the past week or so that uh, you want more coverage on, let us know. Send us a tweet. Leave a comment. And uh, we'll do our best to see if we can put together, either address it in the next show or put together a dedicated uh, or supplemental show covering that topic as well. There's just uh, there's too much, too much to talk about. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we do need to get out of here. We've gone over two hours. So uh, join us next week at 10 p.m. Eastern Wednesdays. And uh, stay tuned to PCPro.com for all the uh, the written content. And we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>